is about 10 p.m. when a meeting at Mount Zion Church in Longdale, Mississippi breaks up. When the 10 African-American parishioners leave the building, they see what they hope never to see. 30 members of the Ku Klux Klan lined up in military fashion with rifles and shotguns. Even more white men are gathered at the rear of the church. The white men announce they are looking for Michael Schwerner. Schwerner is a white civil rights worker they call Jew boy or goatee. He works for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality in Meridian. He is the first white civil rights worker ever to be stationed outside of Jackson. Schwerner has enraged the Klan by helping with a boycott of businesses in Meridian that refuse to employ African Americans. But Schwerner cannot be found at Mount Zion this June night. He is in Oxford, Ohio, attending a program to train recruits for the Mississippi Summer Project. The Summer Project's main goal is to help African Americans in Mississippi register to vote. Frustrated Klan members begin to beat the church members. One Klansman removes 10 gallons of gasoline from a car and spreads it around inside the church. Mount Zion Church is soon engulfed in flames. Mississippi is burning in 1964. The fire at Mount Zion inspired the name for the massive FBI investigation into the murders of the three civil rights workers that occurred less than 48 hours after the blaze. The Mississippi burning case took the FBI deep into the darkness of the Ku Klux Klan. The investigation became the basis for a prosecution that would change the Klan, Mississippi, and the course of civil rights in America. News of the beatings and the fire at Mount Zion reached Michael Schwerner in Oxford, Ohio. Schwerner was anxious to get back to Mississippi to learn what he could about the disturbing events at Mount Zion. In the early morning hours of June 20th, Schwerner and two other civil rights workers loaded into a blue Ford station wagon for the long trip south. With Schwerner was his chief aide, a 21-year-old African-American and native Mississippian, James Cheney. Also along on the trip was Andrew Goodman, a Queens College student and a summer project volunteer. The three young men caught a few hours sleep when they arrived in Meridian. Then they headed northwest in the core wagon towards the scene of the church fire. Longdale is in Neshoba County, which at the time was known as a high risk area for civil rights workers. Before leaving Meridian, Schwerner told a fellow core worker that they should be back in the core office by four o'clock. If they weren't back by 4.30, she should start making phone calls. Neshoba County Sheriff Lawrence Rainey and his deputy Cecil Price were both members of the Klan. Rainey had won the election the previous November after campaigning as the man who can cope with situations that might arise. In Neshoba County, it was well understood what those situations were. Rainey meant to thwart any outsiders who tried to mess with Mississippi's state-enforced policy of segregation. When they reached Longdale, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman inspected the burned-out remains of the Mount Zion Church. They visited the homes of four members of the congregation to learn more about the incident. Their work completed, the three started back towards Meridian around 3 o'clock. They were driving on Highway 16 near the town of Philadelphia when Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price pulled them over, ostensibly for speeding. Price arrested the three civil rights workers and brought them to the Neshoba County Jail in Philadelphia. The deputy sheriff said he suspected they were involved in the church arson. Then Price called a local Klan recruiter, Edgar Ray Killen, to tell him the exciting news of his catch. Little of what happened over the next seven hours in the Neshoba County Jail is known. We know that Schwerner asked to make a phone call, but his request was denied. We also know that a core worker in Meridian called the jail at 520 in the afternoon. Concerned, the caller asked whether anyone at the jail knew anything about the whereabouts of the three civil rights workers. The jailer's wife, who answered the call, Minnie Herring, lied. No, ma'am, no civil rights workers around here. Finally, we know that shortly after 10 o'clock that night, Deputy Sheriff Price showed up at the jail. He told the jailer, Cheney wants to pay off. 
We'll let him pay off and release them all. Price led the three men to their parked car. Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney headed southeast out of town on Highway 19. Price got into his car and started to tail them. Corps staffers, meanwhile, grew ever more worried. Their calls had turned up nothing. At 12.30 a.m. June 22nd, a staff worker placed a call to John Doerr, the Justice Department's point man for Mississippi. Doerr knew Mississippi well, and he feared the worst. Just days earlier in Ohio, Doerr had told Summer Project volunteers there was no federal police force to protect them in Mississippi. After hanging up the phone, Doerr alerted the FBI. The phone rang that morning in the office of Meridian-based FBI agent John Proctor. Within hours, Proctor was on his way to Neshoba County to conduct interviews. He was an Alabama native who had cultivated relationships with local law enforcement officers. After his interview with Cecil Price, the deputy slapped Proctor on the back and said, Hell, John, let's have a drink. Price went to his car and pulled contraband liquor out of his trunk. It was clear that the FBI could not count on help from any state officials. Mississippi Governor Paul Johnson was on record speculating that the missing men could be in Cuba. He said he looked forward to meeting with the federal officials so that he could show them there is complete tranquility between the races in Mississippi. The first big break in the FBI investigation came when Agent Proctor received a tip that a smoldering car had been spotted in northeast Neshoba County. The car turned out to be the burned out blue station wagon the civil rights workers were in the day they disappeared. While at the scene, Proctor met with Joseph Sullivan, the FBI's major case inspector. It was now abundantly clear that President Lyndon Johnson was making the case a top priority. On June 25th, the federal military joined the search for the missing civil rights workers. Busloads of sailors beat their way through snake-infested swamps and woods, searching for bodies. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, at the insistence of LBJ, flew to Jackson, where he announced the opening of the FBI's first office in Mississippi. FBI Inspector Sullivan soon concluded that the case would ultimately be solved by conducting an investigation rather than a search for bodies and for evidence. It became a very difficult investigation. Neshoba County residents were tight-lipped and suspicious. Sullivan summarized the problem. They own the place. In spirit, everyone belongs to the Klan. Locals delighted in sending agents off on wild goose chases or debating agents on issues such as the communist influence on the civil rights movement. Agent Proctor got some of his most useful information from kids. He stuffed candy in his pockets each day before setting out for interviews. Who finally revealed to the FBI the location of the bodies remains something of a mystery. Some years ago, I asked John Doerr, who prosecuted the case, if he knew. He didn't, but he had a theory. It might have been the promise of $30,000 in reward money that caused someone, acting through an intermediary, to provide the information. A second plausible theory emerged in 1994, when confidential FBI sources reported that J. Edgar Hoover had turned to the Colombo crime family for help in cracking the case. This theory gained credence in 2007 when the ex-girlfriend of a mobster named Gregory Scarpa testified in an unrelated murder case. The girlfriend testified that Scarpa put a gun in the mouth of a Mississippi Klansman and demanded information about the location of the bodies. It worked, she said. On August 4, 1964, a Caterpillar bulldozer began excavating on an earthen dam on the property known as the Old Jolly Farm. Cecil Price was at the site at the invitation of Inspector Sullivan. Sullivan wanted to observe the reactions of the deputy, who was by now under heavy suspicion. Price picked up a shovel and dug right in, giving no indication that any of it bothered him. Soon, agents smelled the odor of decaying flesh. Blowflies swarmed in the heat near the cat's splayed. Buzzards circled overhead. 
The heels of a pair of boots, man's boots, poked out from the clay. Proctor took photographs of the body as they were uncovered. The discovery of the bodies seemed to shake clan members involved in the conspiracy. Informants from within the clan would help break the case open. The first information came from a clan member at the periphery of the conspiracy. His information enabled the FBI to focus on more central figures. One clan member who received a great deal of attention from John Proctor was James Jordan, a Meridian speakeasy owner. Over the course of five increasingly rough interviews, Jordan came to see turning state's evidence as his best bet to avoid a long prison term. For $3,500 and help in re relocating himself and his family, Jordan told the full story. He would be the government's key witness. Jordan helped federal authorities to fill in the picture of what happened after the civil rights workers were released from jail. After getting the call about the capture from Price that afternoon, Edgar Ray Killen, an ordained Baptist minister, was busy. He got on the phone to recruit members of the Neshoba and Lauderdale County Claverns. It was time for some butt ripping, as he put it. Local Klan bigwigs met that afternoon at a drive-in in Meridian. Another meeting followed at a mobile home park. The second meeting included the eager younger members, the men who would do the actual killing. Killen told the dozen or more recruits to buy rubber gloves and to be in Philadelphia by 8.15 p.m. Killen took the men on a drive-by tour of the Neshoba County Jail and went over the details of the planned release. Then he headed off to see a departed uncle at a local funeral home and conveniently establish an alibi. When the civil rights workers left the jail in their station wagon, Cecil Price in his patrol car and two other cars filled with young Klan members sped down the road behind them. About 10 miles from the county line, Deputy Sheriff souped up Chevy caught up with the station wagon. James Tri Ch Cheney was driving. He decided to make a run for it and a high-speed chase ensued. Cheney swerved quickly onto Highway 492, but Price made the turn as well. Seconds later, for reasons unknown, Cheney braked his car, and the three surrendered. According to James Jordan, Price walked up to the station wagon and told Cheney, I thought you were going back to Meridian if we let you out of jail. Cheney replied, that's where they were headed. Price said, you sure were taking the long way around. Get out of the car. Three were placed in Deputy Price's car, and soon Price and the trailing cars were traveling in a procession down an unmarked dirt turnoff called Rock Cut Road. It is not known whether the three were beaten before they were killed. Clan informants denied that they were, but there was physical evidence to the contrary, especially for Cheney. What is known is that a 26-year-old dishonorably discharged ex-Marine, Wayne Roberts, was a trigger man. Roberts shot Schwerner first, then Goodman, both at point-blank range. James Jordan shouted, save one for me, and shot Cheney in the stomach. Roberts fired a final bullet into Cheney's head. The bodies were then taken to the dam at Old Jolly Farm. The farm belonged to a local businessman, Olin Burridge. According to one informant, Burridge had once spoken up at a Klan meeting when the members were discussing the arrival in Mississippi of an army of civil rights workers. Hell, he said, I've got a dam that'll hold a hundred of them. After the bodies were carted off for burial, Price returned to his duties in Philadelphia. Around 12.30 a.m., he met with Sheriff Rainey. Given their Klan membership and the close relation between the two, it is almost unimaginable that Price did not relate in full detail the events of that night. In December 1964, a team of federal agents swept through Neshoba and Lauderdale counties, arresting 19 men. 
They were each charged with conspiring to deprive Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman of their civil rights under color of state law. Six days later, a U.S. commissioner dismissed the charges. He concluded that the arrests were based on hearsay evidence. A month later, government attorneys secured indictments against the conspirators from a federal grand jury in Jackson. But again, the Justice Department was disappointed. The defense asked federal judge William Harold Cox to throw out the indictments. Judge Cox was as ardent a segregationist as ever sat on the federal bench. Cox owed his job to his friend and Old Miss Law School roommate, James Eastland, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. In 1962, Senator Eastland had been blocking President Kennedy's appointment of NAACP Counsel Thurgood Marshall to the U.S. Court of Appeals. Kennedy wanted Marshall on the court badly. Eastland proposed a deal. He reportedly told Attorney General Robert Kennedy, tell your brother that if he will give me Harold Cox, I will give him the, and here Eastland used a vile word for an African American. Judge Cox and John Doerr, who would prosecute the Mississippi burning case, knew each other well from earlier voting rights cases brought by the Justice Department. In fact, Doerr had been present when Judge Cox made the most serious mistake of his judicial career. Doerr recalled, I was in his chambers on an application for a temporary injunction. I said to Judge Cox, there's nothing un-American about blacks wanting to vote. Cox responded by describing African-American voter applicants as, quote, a bunch of chimpanzees. Cox's statement appeared the next day in a story in the New York Times and led to the impeachment effort that almost cost Cox his job. Not surprisingly then, Judge Cox dismissed the charges against the conspirators other than Sheriff Rainey and Deputy Price on the ground that the other 17 were not acting under color of state law. In March 1966, the United States Supreme Court unanimously overruled Judge Cox and reinstated the indictments. Trial in the case of United States versus Cecil Price et al. opened on October 7, 1967 in the Meridian courtroom of Judge William Cox. Under new indictments, the list of defendants included 18 Klansmen. Across the street from the courthouse, Raymond Roberts, the brother of one of the defendants, planted a large Confederate flag. Onlookers cheered federal marshals, stood on the courthouse steps, and hoping to discourage anyone who might think of climbing over the police barricades. Inside the building, a crowd of reporters gathered outside the second floor courtroom as 200 potential jurors summoned for the proceedings were there. The Klansmen in, in the dock and those cheering them on were well described by James Silver in his book, Mississippi, The Closed Society. There is an anxious, fearful, frustrated group of marginal white men who exist in every Mississippi community. They are impelled to keep the Negro down in order to look up to themselves. They may not raise their low standard of living by blaming it on Negroes, but they do release an aggressive energy upon a socially accepted scapegoat. Themselves last in everything else, they can still rejoice in having the Negro beneath them. A jury of seven white men and five white women were selected. But selection came only after the Justice Department made an extraordinary effort to ensure that no Klan member slipped onto the jury. Even one would doom the government's case. Prosecutors also wanted a smart, respectable jury to the extent they could get one. John Doerr told me in an interview, we were looking for signs of intelligence. I had my guys look at everybody's homes. We were looking for homes that were well kept up. As expected, defense attorneys exercised peremptory challenges against every one of the 17 potential black jurors. Defense attorneys could get away with that back then, though not today. John Doerr knew that feelings against the federal government ran strong in East Central Mississippi. In his opening statement, he tried to explain the need for a federal civil rights prosecution. Many on the jury probably wondered why this crime didn't result in a state murder trial instead of a federal civil rights trial. 
One of the 12 defense attorneys pointed at Doar in his opening argument. He told the jury that the government's lead lawyer was the same despised justice official who forced the Negro James Meredith into the University of Mississippi. Doar nodded in confirmation. He had been at Meredith's side during all of those first tense days after his registration as the school's first African-American student. The defense made a huge mistake when it cross-examined one of the government's background witnesses. The witness was Reverend Charles Johnson, who worked with Schroener in Meridian. Defense attorney Laurel Weir launched into a series of outrageous questions about whether Schroener was an atheist, whether he went to Cuba, and whether he advocated burning draft cards. The series of questions ended when Weir asked whether, quote, you and Mr. Schwerner didn't advocate and try to get young male Negroes to sign statements agreeing to rape a white woman once a week during the hot summer of 1964. The question prompted Judge Cox to break in and note that such a question was highly improper. He asked the defense attorney if he could show any reason for posing it. Weir said that the question had been passed to him in writing. Cox demanded to know who wrote it. After an awkward silence, one of the defense attorneys admitted that Brother Killen, that is, defendant Edgar Ray Killen, wrote the question. The incident was important because it made clear to the defendants, and more importantly to the jury, that Judge Cox was taking the trial seriously, and that they should too. Dorr called the defense move a tremendous blunder, and he told me it was the turning point of the trial. The heart of the government's case was presented through the testimony of three Klan informants. Wallace Miller described the secret organization of the Meridian area Clavern. He also testified about his conversations with Edgar Ray Killen concerning the Rock Cut Road killings. Delmar Dennis incriminated Sam Bowers, the founder and imperial wizard of the White Knights of the KKK of Mississippi. It was Bowers who, in May 1964, issued an execution order against Schwerner. Dennis quoted Bowers as having said after the killing of Schwerner, It was the first time that Christians had planned and carried out the execution of a Jew. It was also through Dennis that the government introduced the contents of a letter written by Bowers, but pretending to be from an official of a logging company. The letter referred to the murders as the big logging operation, to the Klan participants as sawyers and truck drivers, and to the suspects of the FBI investigation as those deep in the swamp. James Jordan was the government's only witness to the actual killings. Fearing a Klan assassination, the government arranged to have Jordan hustled into court by five agents with guns drawn. Things didn't go well for Jordan in the courtroom. He hyperventilated, he collapsed, and he was carried from the courtroom on a stretcher. On his second try, the obviously nor nervous Jordan made it to the witness stand. Jordan described all the key events of the conspiracy, from the meetings of Klan members in Meridian to the burial of the bodies at Old Jolly Farm. His vivid testimony caused one black female spectator to break down and have to be led from the courtroom, sobbing. The defense case was not much. It consisted mostly of a series of alibi and character witnesses. Various local res residents testified to the reputation for truth and veracity of various defendants. Others testified that they saw the, this defendant or that defendant on the evening of June 21 at locations such as funeral homes or hospitals. John Doerr presented the closing argument for the government. He used the opportunity to address the question that probably still is on many jurors' minds. Why is this a federal prosecution? Doerr told jurors, I am here because your national government is concerned about your local law enforcement. And in a civilization, local law must work if we deserve our liberty and freedom. When local law enforcement officials become involved as participants in violent crime and use their position, power, and authority 
To accomplish this, there is very little to be hoped for, except with the assistance of the federal government. But members of the jury, exactly what does that mean? It means that the federal government is not invading Mississippi. It means only that these defendants are tried for a crime under federal law in a Mississippi city before a Mississippi federal judge in a Mississippi courtroom before 12 men and women from the state of Mississippi. The sole responsibility of the determination of guilt and innocence of these men remains in the hands where it should remain, the hands of 12 citizens from the state of Mississippi. Dort told the jury that this was a calculated, cold-blooded plot. Three men, hardly more than boys, were its victims. Pointing at Price, Dort said that Price used the machinery of law, his office, his power, his authority, his badge, his uniform, his jail, his police car, his police gun. He used them all to take, to hold, to capture, and to kill. Dor concluded by telling jurors that what he and other lawyers say here today will soon be forgotten, but what you 12 do here today will long be remembered. One day after beginning its deliberations, the jury reported to Judge Cox that it was deeply divided, unable to reach a verdict. Over defense objections, the judge responded by giving what the jury, to the jury what is called the Allen charge or the dynamite charge. The strongly worded charge has proven useful many times for breaking open a deadlocked jury. Shortly after Cox gave his charge, urging the jurors to try harder to reach an agreement, Defendant Wayne Roberts joked to Cecil Price, we've got some dynamite for them ourselves. This remark was reported to the judge, and he wasn't amused. On the morning of October 20th, 1967, the jury returned with its verdict. The verdict on its face appears to be the result of a compromise. Seven defendants, mostly from the Meridian area, were convicted. The list of convicted men included Deputy Cecil Price, Imperial Wizard Sam Bowers, Trigger Man Wayne Roberts, and four others. Seven men, mostly from Neshoba County, were acquitted, including Sheriff Lawrence Rainey and the burial site owner Olin Burridge. In three other cases, including that of Edgar Ray Killen, the jury was unable to reach a verdict. The convictions were the first ever in Mississippi for the killing of a civil rights worker. The New York Times called the verdict a measure of the quiet revolution that is taking place in Southern attitudes. John Doerr was mostly satisfied. To have that jury return that verdict was a great thing. His only regret was that the jury didn't reach a verdict on Edgar Ray Killen. Killen was really central to the conspiracy, Doerr said. The vote for conviction for Killen was 11 to 1. The holdout revealed she just couldn't bring herself to vote to convict the preacher. Killen, of course, was, was thrilled. Returning home to Philadelphia after the trial, Killen told a neighbor, man, I thought they were fitting me for overalls over there. On December 29th, Judge Cox imposed sentences ranging from four to 10 years. Judge Cox said of the sentences, quote, they killed one one Jew and a white man. I gave them all what I thought they deserved. After serving four years of his six-year sentence, Cecil Price rejoined his family in Philadelphia, Mississippi. In a 1977 New York Times Magazine interview, Price said that he watched television and enjoyed the show Roots. His views on integration had changed, he said. We've got to accept this is the way things are going to be, and that's it. Mississippi changed, too. In 2005, the state of Mississippi charged Edgar Ray Killen with murder in connection with the slayings of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. And this time, there was no hung jury. Killen was convicted on the lesser charge of manslaughter and sentenced to serve three 20-year terms, one for each conviction. In 2016, Mississippi Attorney General Jim Hood announced he was finally closing the books on the Mississippi burning case. What witnesses there were that remained alive were either unable or unwilling to testify. 
The Mississippi burning trial showed change was coming, coming even to Mississippi. A New York Times editorial on the day after the trial ended said it well. The verdicts are a measure of the quiet revolution taking place in Southern attitudes, a slow, still faltering, but inexorable conversion to a belief in equal justice for all, regardless of race.